You're back. I know what you're thinking. How come we are playing uh, Discovery Tour again? Even though I did my first impressions already, the reason why is because this game was so awesome that I thought it deserved uh, immortalization in the books. It was just so educational. It was, it was pretty um, unique, unlike another, any other game I've uh, played or experienced, so I thought maybe I'd just uh, do it up like Uncharted and Last of Us and record the whole thing. So here we go. Let's just uh, start from the beginning. Egypt. The major regions of Egypt. I don't know how I feel about this long loading time though. It's pretty intense. Music is pretty cool too. So then, um, Alexandria Library. Uh, so we'll be skipping over the ones you've already done uh, because you can just watch the uh, first impressions. But I'll just do all the other ones that we haven't done yet. So here we go. Welcome to the major regions of Egypt. Oh, I'll also be skipping over the ones that seem really boring, you know, because nobody likes the boring ones. Oh, this is cool. You can, like, boat around. Oops, oops, except we broke it. Except we broke it, friends. There we go. Boom. Oh, how do you, how do you roll this? Life in ancient Egypt was concentrated along the shores of the Nile and divided into two regions. Lower Egypt was situated on the Nile Delta near the Mediterranean, well, cool. and Upper Egypt was at the south reaching into Africa. Due to its proximity to the Mediterranean, temperatures in Lower Egypt were less extreme than in Upper Egypt. Hmm. That's cool. There's a lot like a BBC doc. That's kind of why I wanted to play it too. It's just like so informative. It's a very interactive way of playing the game. Until 3100 BCE and the unification of Egypt, each region had its own pharaoh and crown. Oh, like Lower Egypt's crown was red mayors. and marked with symbols of papyrus and bees. Upper Egypt's crown was white with symbols of lotus and sedge grass. That's cool. I like that. So there's totally water in Egypt then. Way back when. Now it's like a dry place. Both regions had competing major cities, Ooh, most awesome. notably Memphis in Lower Egypt and Thebes in Upper Egypt. There were different religious cults in both regions, each worshipping their own major gods. I like how they call them religious cults. Cults. They never call religions cults nowadays. Many of the temples were designed in such a way as to represent the two regions, and ceremonies often incorporated Upper and Lower Egypt in their rituals. Huh. This is a lot like Vietnam. There's, um, Ning Bing. I think it's called. It's like water and, uh, shops. It's pretty cool. Alright. Done. Let's continue. Uh, Bringer of Life. And hopes. Okay, Bringer of Life. Now River. Let's see what's up with the Nile River. I'm not too happy about this loading time though, it's a little, little long. Oh, speak of the devil. Guess not that long after all. Sorry. Welcome to Bringer of Life, the River Nile. Two is a boost. Cool. The ancient Egyptians called the dark, fertile soil of the Nile the Black Lands, and the surrounding desert was referred to as the Red Lands. The dramatic difference of productive land opposed to barren desert had a deep influence on cultural ideology, mythology, and religion. Hmm. Interesting. That's a really basic name. Black lands and red lands because of the colors. 
The Nile determined much of Egyptian civilization. For example, the seasonal cycle of the Nile was so consistent that ancient Egyptians created their calendar around it. Huh. The flood season, or Akhet, was when the departing floodwaters left arable soil for crops. Well, it was cool. followed by the growing and harvesting seasons, known as Peret and Shemu. These regular seasons, along with abundant wildlife and rich soil, meant that Egypt's denizens were able to nourish themselves and ensure their country's strength in trade. Hmm. So Egypt was a major trading hub? Makes sense, because they were very powerful. The River Nile, flowing from the south to the north, neatly traversed through both Upper and Lower Egypt. All of Egypt's major cities were built along this narrow ribbon of life. Protected by mountain ranges wow. and deserts which awesome. acted as natural barriers to enemies and sustained by the Nile's plants and wildlife, Egyptian civilization enjoyed economic and cultural prosperity for over 4,000 years. Really? That's cool. 4,000 years of awesome. Both ancient Egyptians and ancient Greeks referred to the Nile as the river in their respective languages. Stretching a distance of over 6,700 kilometers, the Nile is one of the longest rivers in the world. It flows south to north, spanning 11 countries. The River Nile originates in the region of the great sub-equatorial lakes, including one of the largest in the world, Lake Victoria near Tanzania. Hmm. That's cool. Wow. Who knew it was this big? It was vast. Pretty awesome. I love how interactive they made this game, you know? It's like... It's like... Wow, this is what it would be like if we're here? Sick. It's very immersive. VR would be sick for this. The river flows through African equatorial forests, swamps, volcanic lands, steppes, and deserts, splitting apart for a while and picking up various sediments from each region and carrying them all the way to Egypt. Hmm. Its main artery, known as the White Nile, rejoins with the Blue Nile in Khartoum. This is where it weaves through rich deposits of silt and nutrients, carrying them along in its wake. Okay, so the river's what brings the uh, minerals around. Didn't know that. So it's just like a perfect storm of like, um, supplies and resources, I guess. The Nile crosses six cataracts from the south to the north, creating natural obstacles between the various sections of the river. The cataracts are long zones of about 100 kilometers where the bubbling and rapidly swirling waters advance tumultuously amid enormous heaps of rocks and benches of hard stone. That's kind of cool. It's very, that's what creates a protective layer, I guess. Slows all the, uh, Bad people down. Mush. Mush. I wonder if there's like a trader boat. You see all the. Probably is. You see the vegetables. It's pretty cool. It is after crossing Nubia and the first cataract that the river officially returns to Egypt in Aswan. There are still a thousand kilometers before it reaches Cairo and the Delta, bringing wow. life to those living on its shores before it eventually empties into the Mediterranean Sea. 
I wonder how big this place is, like, if they ever explain that, you know? How big is, uh, the span of Egypt? They make it sound big in the uh, description. Oh, we're gonna crash. Oh, oh. Too bad. really cool. Ancient Egyptian irrigation and water use was centered around the Nile. However, they also had access to streams and rivers, as well as several large lakes. The Delta, situated at the north end of the Nile, also known as Lower Egypt, is a large irrigated area where the river splits into several tributaries. Hmm. So they dump all their waste in the river. That's kind of cool. I mean, not cool, like, the whole waste thing, but it's like, it's cool how they took care of irrigation. This is R2 boost work. Shine, but nothing's working. Okay, is that bracing it? Boom. The Delta had several major brackish coastal lakes, bodies of water separated from the sea by thin strips of land. A mix of deep to shallow waters, salt swamps, and sand plains, these lakes were refuge to a wealth of species, as well as water and land plants. Huh. The occasional bandit could also be found sheltering within the denser reeds, waiting for the unwary traveler. Oh, no way. That's crazy. Makes sense, though. Deserts of Egypt. That was pretty cool. So, Egypt relied heavily on its water system for trade and resources. And it was just lucky that there was uh, natural land that's like the way it is. It's not the heat that gets you. Well, it might. Welcome to Deserts of Ooh. Egypt. Oh, that was brutal. I want to go to desert one day, that'd be cool. Reaching out on either side of the lush Nile are the harsh arid western desert and the mountainous eastern desert. They cover nearly 94% of Egypt. Each of these parent deserts have their own microclimate and contain several smaller deserts Whoa. with a distinctive fauna and flora. Whale fossils were discovered within the depths of the Sahara. Known as the Valley of the Whales, this location is evidence of the seas which once covered the area. Makes sense. Because uh, sand is made up of broken up rocks, so it's definitely an ocean area. The before. White Desert in the northeast of the Sahara owes its name to its white limestone soil, contrasting with the yellow sand. That's cool. The wind has eroded the rocks of the White Desert into stone mushrooms, the most famous of which is referred to as the Finger of God. Huh. I love how like they take something like that's pretty impressive like landscape wise and they, they create a legend out of it. Whoa. It's very rudimentary nave thinking. The Great Sand Sea is a large unbroken desert that reaches out through western Egypt and eastern Libya. Ooh, it is home to a unique geological formation known as Libyan silica glass. The pale yellowish green material ranges from pebble sized fragments to glass rocks the size of rough boulders. Cool. 
let's get it. Wow, Caesar would sleep at odd hours. Okay. Welcome to the Katara Depression. Oh, that's the impressive. The Katara Depression is located in the northwest what? part of Egypt. Reaching 18,000 square kilometers, the basin is 133 meters below sea level and covered with salt. It is the second lowest point in Africa wow. after the Afar Depression. Oh, there's water over there. Cool. The climate is very arid, with average temperatures reaching 36 degrees Celsius. The famous Siwa oasis is located on the protected southwestern region. Today, the Katara Depression is utilized for oil exploration. Hmm. Makes sense. Siwa. beings wow safer beings but they also said that the cats were there to help protect against snakes and uh, rats so it makes sense why you think the safer is protecting you from death by snakes welcome to siwa oh well, that's cool okay okay The Siwa Oasis is in the western desert of Egypt. Geographically, the Siwa Oasis is located in a depression 20 meters below sea level. Its natural springs and warm climate aided in the bountiful production of date trees. Huh. Yeah. Though clearly influenced to some degree by Egyptian and African culture, the area's isolation resulted in a unique society and language. While they worshipped the same deities, Siwan temple architecture differed from traditional Egyptian temples. Hmm. Old Kingdom Egyptians referred to the oasis as cauldron, due to its unique geographical structure. Ooh, the water. Oases were crucial for nomadic tribes and caravans. Without them, there was no chance of survival in an otherwise harsh landscape. As such, oases quickly became hubs for trade, as well as areas of political control. Makes sense. Resources. Because of the dry climate, there is very little rainfall to sustain the oases. Instead, underground rivers flood the natural basins. Since many oases have a north-south orientation, parallel to the Nile, some geologists suggest they were once tributaries of the mighty river. There is evidence that ancient Egyptians attempted to create some oases. Oh. The Libyan oases are the best known, as they are geographically and culturally linked to the Nile Valley and the Delta. These western oases have a distinct geology from the other regions of Egypt. The most famous and important oases are Karga, Dakla, Farafra, Baharia, and Siwa. Hmm. Wonder if they're still around. Or if this is just like for the game, like old school. The Spring of the Sun is one of many thermal sources in Siwa, with the particularity that Cleopatra would have bathed in this one, giving it its name. The presence of the source beneath was attested already by Herodotus during the 5th century BCE, when the oasis was called Amuneon by the Greeks of Cyrene. Hmm. Sorry, natural underwater waters. That's cool, underground waters. Oracles predicted the future, delivered omens that could be more or less obscure, huh. and offered divine guidance. The Siwan Oracle was considered one of the three greatest of the ancient world alongside the oracles of Delphi and hey, Dodoni. I've been to Delphi. Because of the Greek colonies in Cyrenaica, the temple associated Zeus with the worship of Amun. Oh, that's cool. Amun and Zeus are similar. Um, 
Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the oracles of Delphi, uh, they were all like high on fumes. People just. Uh, it is no to wonder high talk. that Alexander the Great made the perilous journey to Siwa in order to consult the oracle, emulating the actions of mythical heroes such as Hercules and Perseus. Mm, true. This action earned the approval of the oracle, who validated his claim as Pharaoh of Egypt. Really? He was Alexander. confirmed as the son of Amun, conferring upon him the most legitimate claim to date of all Egypt's foreign invaders. Ooh. That seems very The like powerful and the rich would send based. gifts or travel great distances in order to ensure their good fortune by gaining the blessing of the Oracle of Siwa. Every successful blessing only increased the soothsayer's prestige. <laughs> Runner Eubotus, a famous citizen of Cyrene, consulted the oracle in order to know if he would win the 93rd Olympic Games race in 408 BCE. He did, enhancing the standing of the C1 oracle in the process. It's weird how, um, that was just a lucky guess on her part, or their part. Uh, it's weird how like this seems very like underdeveloped as compared to like Rome and um, Roman Greece, but I guess it's like because this is in the desert, maybe. The temple of the Oracle of Amun was built in the sixth century BCE by Pharaoh Amasis. In the game, its entrance is guarded by ram-headed sphinxes, oh. the animal representing Amun. They were inspired by similar statuary located at the British Museum. Another option would have a Greek-influenced representation of Zeus Amun, a human-headed sphinx with horns. This representation of Zeus Amun was very popular in Siwa. Interesting. Again, so much uh, uh, relatability here. We got Amun being related to Zeus, and if you read the uh, Old Testament and um, the stories of the Greek gods, they're very similar as well which makes sense because if we all came from the same place it's like you're you're taking your myth and like spreading it and just like changing it according to the region and the local tales you know what I mean? it's like a uh, marvel in dc like you got superman you got shazam similar powers different origins pretty much the same guy not really though but you you understand what i'm trying to say uh, let's see Fire. Let's hear Persians. Oh, cool. Ha, ah, that's funny. Children are a way of uh, conquering death. Makes sense. A lot of people still do that to this day. Welcome to the Fayum. Oh, what is this place? The Fayum Oasis is an enormous basin in the western desert that formed from the Nile's overflow. As such, it is not considered a true oasis, though it gives its name to the region, which covers Lake Morris. The oasis harbors some of the oldest archaeological artifacts of the region indicating that the area has been inhabited by hunters and gatherers since the Neolithic period. Huh. Cool. The Fayum Oasis drains into Lake Morris, which was a large freshwater lake, but at some time became a saltwater lake. In the 12th dynasty, ancient Egyptians redirected the water flow with a dam and dug a supply canal using the lake as their reservoir. Ooh, human ingenuity. Irrigation enabled them to continue growing crops of figs, grapes, and olives year-round. Farming Reed so boats, big. Feluccas, triremes, and kerkeros were the most commonly found craft within the landlocked waters of Egypt. So these they were used for various purposes, ranging from daily fishing, trade, warfare, and travel. Warfare, to the ferrying really? of massive stone blocks used to build the great monuments of Egypt. Okay. Okay, friends. We are stuck. We are stuck. There you go. Man, this is a hard boat to... 
to maneuver. So Egypt seems very like islandy, you know? It's compared to like Greece and uh, Rome. Rome seems more like industrial. Greece just seems seems like a mix between the two. We're all holding that R2 for the boost. Get it. Too bad he's not really boosting anything. Or hippo. The most impressive pyramids of ancient Egypt date from the Old Kingdom and can be found on the sites of Giza, Saqqara, and Dashur. Oop, hit him. However, one particularly famous pyramid of the time is located elsewhere. During the Middle Kingdom, some pharaohs chose the Fayum as their final resting place. One such ruler was Amenemhat III. His pyramid left a mark on the imagination of antique chroniclers. They refer to it as the labyrinth, mostly due to the vast mortuary temple complex at the foot of the pyramid. Herodotus mentioned that he had visited 12 courts and over 3,000 of its chambers. But he was also well known for being prone to hyperbole. <laughs> okay. Big talk. Amenemhat's pyramid was built with a brick core and covered with stone slabs designed to be impenetrable. The burial chamber, made out of a single block of sandstone, is unique in its design. Made by a single block. Richard Lepsius and Flinders Petrie both explored the pyramid site, measuring 385 meters by 158 meters, and identified it as the location of the labyrinth. Their research conditions were difficult as most of the site had been submerged by the nearby canal. Furthermore, the stones from the complex and the outer casing of the pyramid had been quarried away long ago. Ubisoft decided to give life back to this lost monument and the many crypts that were said to be devoted to the sacred crocodile god, Sobek. Huh. That's cool. Artistic licensing, I like it. Founded during the 5th dynasty, the site was popular during the 12th dynasty under the name of Shedet. During the Ptolemaic era, the metropolis was named Crocodilopolis by the Greeks <laughs> in honor of the crocodile god Sobek. During wow. the Greco-Roman era, the Clerux, soldiers of the Ptolemies, settled there after their military service and expanded the irrigation systems. Irrigation and water distribution tripled the arable land and turned the city into a lush and rich area. Well, cool. 27,000 inhabitants lived in its precinct at its height. The city's location was strategic in controlling the many small waterways connecting to the main canal, and thus the Nile. Location, location, location. That's pretty cool. The region's main cult was that of Sobek of a Shedet, a divinity associated with water and fertility, both very important to an area that depended on irrigation. Many local villages had the title Town of Sobek added to their official designations. During festivals, ancient Egyptians recited hymns to Sobek, asking for his divine intervention. Greek settlers and later Romans oh, wow. would help the temple of Sobek's economy to flourish by adopting the local embalming mortuary rites. Their sarcophagi were beautifully painted and adorned with amazingly realistic portraits. Wow, that's, that's pretty beautiful. Very similar to the cult of the Apis bull in Memphis, a living crocodile was worshipped within the precinct of Crocodilopolis's main temple. Oh, no way, there's a crocodile. Known as Sobek to the Egyptians, and Sukos to the Greeks, 
It was reported by Strabo that priests fed it with meat, wine, and honeyed milk. Huh. They covered its body with jewels and gold. After its death, it was embalmed and placed within the crocodile's grotto, alongside thousands of other mummified crocodiles. So who is the one who had, uh, let's see this bike to me. Three things are necessary when exploring Egypt. Water, a good camera, and an omnipresent voice coming from nowhere. So who's the one who, who is in charge of, like, um, decorating that bad boy? You know? Uh, City of Memphis. Is it all true straws? Not me, not me. To go in there and put that necklace on. Have you ever tried to put a collar on a dog? Or a harness? Very difficult. Couldn't imagine a uh, crocodile. Extra difficult. to the city of Memphis. Throughout all ancient Egyptian periods, wow. cities had one thing in common. They were situated along the Nile's shores. Cities were often designated for government or for worship. Major cities had several temples dedicated to numerous gods and goddesses. Egyptians referred to the organization of their cities as a sepat or later on by the Persian term Nome. There were 20 sepat in Lower Egypt and 22 in Upper Egypt. One of the largest was Memphis, located in Lower Egypt. It was a key center for religious temples, including their most important deity, Ta, god of creation. Huh. Thebes, located in Upper Egypt, competed with Memphis and featured as both a political and a religious center. Two important temples, Luxor and Karnak, were built there. A minor capital of the Sayite dynasty was the city of Sais. This was the last native Egyptian capital of Egypt. Cool. During the third dynasty, under Pharaoh Djoser, wow. Memphis became Isn't the that? first religious and administrative capital of Egypt. Even when the political capital of Egypt decentralized itself, pharaohs were crowned in this sacred city in order to legitimize their ascension to the throne. Oh, well, darn. Memphis was also referred to as the city with the hundred doors or the white walls. These names were in reference to the wall which surrounded the city. Under the protection of Ta, god of craftsmen, the city was a thriving religious and economic hub. Oh, huh, that's cool. Oh, I'll do that one after. That was cool. I like that. Uh, let's see how many we got. Uh, oh, Tumba Zoo. Nice. Uh, let's do. Let's do one last, and then we'll call it a day for this one. But this is pretty cool. I I do like the. Uh, the knowledge being spread here. It's awesome. We'll end off with this one. See what it's all about. This is along here. Oh, hijacked body of Alexander, yeah. Oh. Welcome to Rediscovering Egypt. In the 19th century, the increased intensity of tourism and excavations, as well as the outflow of antiquities to other countries, threatened Egypt's archaeological heritage. Oh, Egyptians took part in this destruction by ransacking sites for artifacts to sell, quarrying ah. stones from ancient monuments, and removing sebak, ancient mud bricks, to reuse for their own purposes. Oh, that's, that's not cool. A major step in conserving Egypt's heritage was taken in 1858, when the Viceroy of Egypt,
created the Antiquities Service. Supported by a team of foreign scholars, Auguste Mariette exerted an iron grip on the service. He carried out his work across Egypt and into Nubia, intervening on almost every major site. Aware of the necessity of keeping unearthed artifacts in Egypt, Mariette requested a museum be created for that purpose in 1858. This museum was the ancestor of the Egyptian Museum. Cool. Cool. Gaston Maspero, Mariette's successor, expanded and reorganized the Antiquities Service and instigated laws regulating the export of artifacts. French scholars ran the service until it passed into Egyptian hands in the 1950s. As of the mid-19th century, Egyptology was fast becoming a recognized discipline within both private institutions and learned societies. Huh. Oh, over there. I sat down. Well, that's cool. I'm like an obelisk. <laughs> a French architect, archaeologist, and former researcher, Jean-Claude Golvin, now specializes in the artistic reconstruction of ancient cities and monuments. To date, he has created more than 800 drawings, which include three volumes focusing on the reconstitution of ancient Egypt. His work is exquisitely detailed and can be found in books and museums around the world. Oh, good for that guy. A lot of research probably went in. Oh, okay. The team was thrilled to collaborate with Jean-Claude Galvin in order to recreate Egypt for the game. Oh, that's sick. In the 19 exclusive watercolors he created for the team, Golvin used scientific data as the base and then extrapolated to provide a full interpretation of various locations and monuments in ancient Egypt. Oh, looks like a town. Both early sketches and fully rendered images were then used by the team as references while building the world of Assassin's Creed origins. Although ancient Egypt's rich religious culture and its mortuary monuments continue to be investigated, the modern discipline of Egyptology has shifted focus. Rather than single-mindedly retrieving impressive artifacts, Egyptologists today focus instead on increasing the body of knowledge. In the past, excavations took place in the field, and while that is still the case today, much of the work on Egyptology now takes place in libraries and archives. Ooh. Today, archaeology in Egypt relies on an interdisciplinary approach where traditional Egyptologists are helped by a wide spectrum of scientists from other disciplines and new non-invasive techniques. GPS data, satellite imaging, and ground-penetrating radar allow archaeologists to gain a sense of what lies underneath the ground before excavating. Awesome. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the uh, first part of... Uh, oh, nice jump. The first part of uh, Assassin's Creed Discovery Tour. Uh, we'll finish up this chapter soon. Take your time. I'll wait. And then head over to... It's not to, like ancient uh, Egypt is going anywhere. The other ones. This is very cool though. I, I do like the interactivity. Uh, the knowledge gained is invaluable. It's very much like a BBC documentary, except you're playing a first person account of. Uh, well, that's cool. You can climb it. First person account of the whole uh, thing. So, yeah. Until next time, we get learned. Boom. We're on the top. Oh, wow, that's awesome. A lot of color here. I like how it's like. It's like kind of basic and then you can go like the to the rich area which is more developed it's kind of like our own cities today but anyway, this is very cool yeah all right until next time see you. Oh. Bye -bye.